Hi, welcome back to my channel. My name is Isabel. I'm sorry for the lighting, but we are recording at nighttime. So I know you can see the reflection in my glasses. I'm so sorry about that, but I hope that's not too distractful because today we're talking about The Pursuit of Love by Nancy Mitford. This is a book written in 1945. So it's not recent, but it is appalling how fresh and modern it feels. If you saw my last video, the wrap up of the books I read during October, you saw my review about it. And I think that if you enjoy The Great Gatsby, you would enjoy The Pursuit of Love probably even more. And I want to expand on why. So I'm going to focus this book review in the themes and conversations surrounding this novel. This is a satirical novel and I know that the first no-no you hear when you're going to review a book or think about it critically is do not look at the author's biography and try to assume things towards the novel. But in the case of The Pursuit of Love, it is imperative for you to know that Nancy Mitford was from upper class British society, which is where this book um, develops and portrays these types of characters. Therefore, she drew from a lot of people she personally knew and created this caricatures, but also complex characters. And speaking of characters, I think that is the winning formula of why the book becomes very entertaining as it is funny and the characters become caricatures at some moments, but at the same time, they have this human aspect because they were based in real people. Our main character, Linda Rutley, is what we would know as a mistress, as an eclectic woman, as someone that is just drifting along. However, the story is told by her cousin Fanny, who has brought up in middle class family values and has a very traditional, accomplished intellectual life compared to her cousin. The dynamic in the book is that of the Great Gatsby or that it shares with the Great Gatsby is that our narrator cares deeply about Linda. Therefore, she makes assumptions and she makes criticism of our main character. However, she always has this empathetical and I don't know, coming from a loving point of view. Therefore, if we think about it as terms of is this reliable or unreliable narrator, we're still in the gray area of it is reliable. However, it does make a lot of excuses for her cousin and the criticism that we get is more of um, implied or that we have to step in and be like, well, this is outrageous. But if we generate this outrage towards a the character, then we become kind of like traditionalist or conservative. And why is that? Well, Linda is a very interesting character to put in this context of the in-between war period because she steps further into misconduct or moral misconduct, depending on these values that we have in the novel. Linda craves a sense of identity that comes for being in this in-between war period. Towards the end of the novel, she wanders and it's saddened from, by the idea that if people look back on her life, they're going to think of her and her family members as sad little characters that were marked by two wars instead of them being their flamboyant, extravagant personalities. And this strains from what we have seen, for example, with Fitzgerald and Hemingway as these people that were marked by World War I and their personality was totally shaped by that. And we also have those in World War II narratives. However, these characters are so detached and I'm going to talk about how they are very entitled and not self-aware at all, but how that makes them detached from war and detached from poverty and detached for violence, which generates a sense of, oh, why is this happening to me? I was meant to be such a great person and now this war is very much like an inconvenience. And we can think about class and money and just privilege in general, but I'm going to get there, promise. <laughs> so thinking about these characters and their sense of entitlement, I want to do this book review in depth also because I think that superficially it can be seen as a very transgressive book in terms of white people or rich people's problem. And I'm going to be honest with you, that's a very valid reading. If you read this book, you might be like, oh, this is just some bullshit 
of characters that have no depth, no intellectual pursuits, no empathetical feelings towards people who are dying, who are people who are suffering, towards poor people. They are just scum of society. And yes, that is very true. They are. And it's interesting because if we think of it as in the light of satirical and as a humorous portrayal of the upper classes, we could think, oh, it's poking fun of them. But how self-aware is this book? Really? I don't know. You can make your own opinion after you read it. But I think that our narrator being a middle class woman tries to be that self-awareness from Nancy Mitford from being a woman that yet yeah, belonged to an upper class, but that has studied, that has lived abroad, that wants to poke fun of these blind spots from her upbringing. However, if we think about that, Fanny is also a middle-class woman with a lot of privileges, from with an education, with servants, with uh, nannies. So it's not really that self-aware. So if you want to look for that, this book might be a bit disappointing even when it tries to be self-aware. The thing is, in the context of parody or in satire, characters like this are very difficult to find because it's not that Linda is likable, it's that she's hopeless. It kind of reminds me of the portrayal of Emma Woodhouse in Emma by Jane Austen because she is helpless. She doesn't realize a lot of things. And so she has all these points of view and all these opinions that are outrageous. But when you read it, it's like, well, she doesn't know any better. She's not prepared to do anything. Her upbringing didn't prepare her for the real world. And she is just an eternal child, an eternal wild beast. And that is the product of this environment. So instead of narrowing down on the independent characters, I think it's more of a social criticism on these upbringings, in these environments, in these social spheres of entitlement that creates people like this. And I say people like this very lightly and casually because here you and me are in conversation. But we need to remember these are characters. Even though they were inspired by real people, they are caricatures, they are templates. And if we think of them as people, we might commit a big flaw of critical thinking that it might ruin our experience reading this. So I feel like, yes, some people could hate this book and some people could absolutely love it. And it all depends with what type of mindset you come in reading. Now, speaking of class, this is a great example of how you can make um, criticism about class with so many examples between upper and middle class. However, the lower classes are completely ignored in this novel because they're not in the mindset of the characters. However, if we think of the grand scheme of things, there is a war happening, there is poverty and bombing happening, and none of these characters think about that for a second. So that is the acuteness of the situation. As I mentioned in Emma and Jane Austen, the Napoleonic Wars and the slave, the transatlantic slave is kind of implied and is never mentioned. However, we also deal with this very limited stratus between the middle class and the upper class and how those differ. Well, however, the lower class is completely ignored as it usually happens in this type of literature in this time period. What I mean with Focusing on the upper class and the middle class is the difference in values and the difference in education and the views of society. As I said, Fanny is a middle class woman and she's married to a university don. So her upbringing is more marked on her mother abandoning her and her aunt raising her to like feminist modern views education for women, betterment of society, the importance of intellectual projects. And then we have uh, her cousin, Linda, who has this more traditional aristocratic background of you have to be raised to be a wife and to have children and to entertain. However, Linda doesn't receive a very proper education even in that sense. She doesn't want to entertain her first husband's 
uh, guests because they're boring and she doesn't have any maternal feelings toward her child and she doesn't really like being a wife she likes being enamored and I want to zoom down now on the title the pursuit of love what does that tell us well the central point I think of the dilemma that separates Linda and Fanny is is the pursuit of love worth pursuing is that something that is only found outside marriage. Here we have a dichotomy that is presented to them as you can either be married or you can either be in love. And this pursuit of love is what takes Linda away from marriages because she stops being enamored by her first impression, her gut feeling of a person. And that is something that we as modern readers are somehow beyond i'm not not saying beyond entirely as humanity but in narrative in narratives we don't see that anymore as much as i guess something happened in our cultural mindset that we know that we can be in love and we can be married or that we can be in love and it doesn't have to end up in marriage however i'm sooning i'm taking you back to this time period and the expectations that were for these women as you are always going to be married to the same person if you are not you had just taken your family and your own person into disgrace and you are just deviant with linda we see her as a very empathetical character because i feel like we can all relate to wanting to feel love and her own definition of love is very interesting at the same time because is that is all the glittery moments, is the honeymoon phase, is not really knowing each other, but having a sexual attraction, a chemical connection, and something based in superficial moments. And then Fanny, who is married, we don't hear a lot about her marriage, but she reflects on that. And she doesn't really envy Linda, but she does think about all the routines of her life, all the things that she has to do now that she's a mother, that she is a wife, all of the heavy burdens that she has to carry and just admires how Linda doesn't care about that and doesn't let anyone put those burdens on her and just bolts and leaves and finds another guy because there are so many guys. Another thing about Linda is how her character just falls in love without a mold. And it seems that with each husband, we see a different variation of infatuation. Her first husband, she just made him up. She danced with him once. She thought he was funny. And it turns out he wasn't funny. And he was a very much traditionalist and a total bore. So her second husband or second relationship, you'll see he's a socialist. He doesn't care about her. He cares about everyone. He has to have a cause and he needs a secretary not a lover the third one he's french and he's very important and he has had many affairs so he knows about it and he kind of takes linda's down like he humbles her a lot as yeah you're not a beauty queen and you're not in a fairy tale this is an affair and as it is crude it is also highly idealized but linda which again, we don't see her really outgrow that. So again, if you are looking for books that have big character development, you're not gonna find that here. And the bigger conversations about motherhood are very left for the reader to decide. I feel like it goes political in so many ways, yet motherhood is left us a very much open book and I don't know I feel like that's something that I missed towards the end I was like that's it it's also a very short book I, this version has other stories in it but this is how much the pursuit of love is it's 150 pages it's not that much if I needed to summarize I would say that some of the main themes is the abandonment of the pretense of marriage that is a big thing as we have many marriages in the novel 
seen through different lenses and they all mark by what generation they belong to and what class they belong to and how those ideas get deconstructed through time or through the novel. Then we also have the lack of guilt or the pursuit of the affair as infidelity being the norm. If you want to make a big statement about that, it could be that humans are not monogamous or they're not meant to be and it's only socially created. Therefore, characters like Linda that are very gut impulse driven are just going to go through that and they're not going to submit to rigid societal expectations. And there is a difference between middle class and aristocratic backgrounds. And here it seems to be, a, once again, something about nature, which is something that I hate because it's very close to racism. If you think about that, upper classes, especially in Europe, which are very ancient countries, tend to be, the majority of them, white. When there is a mixture, then there's a dilution of race. It gets diluted into grays, it gets diluted from grays to deviance, and it has something to do with blood, it has to do something with nature. It's not something that you can possess as money and currency. It's something that you are born with. And tied to that, no, and I mentioned that not to get political, but because in the novel, we have this deep allegiance with family. Linda and Fanny are family, even though they belong to different social classes. That doesn't really matter at the end because they come from this line that is aristocratic. And therefore, they have this spirit. They have something in them that makes them wild and makes them effervescent and fascinating. And every family member is like that. That makes them special. However, if we think about it, there's nothing other than them being from a higher class. They don't even have that much money compared to other characters that come from a middle back that come from a middle class background. Yet it always comes to nature. And I am fascinated about that concept as if it's still prevalent. Even if we think we're so beyond this, it's so prevalent in our culture that if you see, for example, I don't know, news coverage about Meghan Markle and Kate Middleton, when people talk about Kate Middleton, they go, she is just a natural. And that is to say, she's an upper class white lady. They just don't want to say it. And I have nothing against them. They're just examples. But it's here and it's in the novel and it's in our life and it's in so many novels. Something else I want to highlight and kind of rescue from this is the reading experience. It's a fun read, it's a light read, it's sharp, it's witty, it's funny, and it's short. If you want to, I don't know, maybe you have a good reads challenge that you need to get ahead on, or you just want to have a good time, I feel like with this background story that I just blurped at you, you're going to be prepared to read The Pursuit of Love or dose it up. I know that it can be come tiresome to read so much entitlement in just one novel but at the same time it's a bit um, i don't know how to say it humanizing as we are drawn to antagonize people who are like this in real life and having the exercise of fiction and being able to have an example that we can be empathetic towards i feel like it makes us better people and it gives us great entertainment as well. So I hope you give it a chance. This is my review for The Pursuit of Love. Thanks for watching, keep reading, and when you're not, follow me on all my social media, link down below. You know, if you have any recommendation or you have a request for a video, leave it a comment down below. Bye. This is my new cup.